All right. So tonight uh, we have Bob the Shooter, and he's going to be talking to us about the gameful life. Uh, I will um, now turn it over to Bob. Perfect. Thanks, Joe. Um, let's see. I'm going to share my screen, share my sound. Um, the right screen, I think, is the one. Reorganizing my screen a little bit here. All right. Yeah. So, um, Looks like everything's working then, so uh, let me know if it doesn't. But anyways, I'm Bob de Schutter. I'm a Belgian professor, and, and last summer I started working for Northeastern University here in Boston. Um, so that's my connection to the city, but I'm still fairly new here. And in this presentation, I'm going to be talking all about this guy. Oh, haha, <laughs> me! Or, well, I'm not actually going to talk about that guy. I'm going to talk about the 65-year-old version of me, the guy who, according to the internet, will look like this. And I'm very happy that he still has a great head of hair, but he's pretty frustrated with the games that are being made for his demographic. So he traveled back in time to tell me to do this talk and to change this future. So that's why I'm here. Let's change the future. Are you with me? Okay, now that introduction obviously does not work well when you're doing an online Zoom talk, but I decided to do it nonetheless, because you see, I've done that intro before uh, many times, even if I've studied and designed games in relation to the 50 plus demographic for most of my professional career, which is almost 20 years now. And during that time, I've used that joke as a typical opener for presentations like this one, where I'm presenting my work and talking about designing for a 50 plus year old audience. However, I feel that over the past year or two, mostly the ones that were shrouded in COVID, a lot of changes occurred in relation to this topic. And that joke didn't really feel the same to me anymore. It used to be about this 20, 30 year old guy telling people how to make games for 50 plus year olds, which is what made it funny. But these days, I'm closer to being 50 than being 20, and it just lands differently. And also, when I look back at my own aged picture, I don't really see an older version of myself anymore. I just wants to play good games in later life. I've started to see somebody who never stop playing games somebody who might have played a bit obsessively even and with that somebody who looks for meaning and beauty in the games they consume and who has a rich history of doing that for an entire lifespan so looking at that silly joke again when i was preparing this talk it made me realize how different my generation the younger part of generation x is from the boomers and later on older gen xers that i've been studying for the past 20 years and how we are different from upcoming older generations. And I'll show you what I mean uh, with that by visualizing it. It's a bit of a complicated visual, but bear with me. At the top, we see the three typical demographic groups that you'll find in the research, 65 plus 50 to 64 and 35 to 49. Now, it makes sense to cluster people like this when you're not taking a closer look, but the second you do, it becomes clear that their potential exposure to games is vastly different. I mean, I was taught in developmental psychology that the identity forming years of our lives uh, tend to end around 25. So for the 65 plus demographic, um, if you look at the, at the slide, that means that you would barely get the early years of video games of anything at all. For 35 plus demographic, however, people have experienced uh, Xbox and PlayStation 2 games before they turn 25. So it's a vastly different experience in terms of variety of games, the complexity they have, the fidelity and the ubiquity of games uh, in society. It's also a shift though from games being mostly a niche hobby for computer enthusiasts to a mainstream phenomenon for every child whose parents can afford these games. Um, and with that, there's a shift between games as a niche activity to an important part of players' identities, maybe as a meaningful hobby or even a lifestyle. And with that, as these generations grow older, the work that researchers and designers like myself have done in relation to the older demographic is going to have to adapt, obviously. Um, we're going to have to ask ourselves some different research questions. And instead of figuring out how to get someone who doesn't play games as much to engage with games, we now have to fit games that we design within a rich prior history that upcoming generations have with that medium. And I'm going to argue in this talk to do that, we're going to have to understand their gameful lives. So with that, I should probably point out that I'm using the term gameful here in a literal manner to indicate a life that's full of playing games as opposed to perhaps a life in which games were, I don't know, um, introduced halfway through or 
maybe periodically. However, if you're familiar with the field of gameful design, um, I should point out that I'm not rejecting that interpretation either. In a nutshell, um, gameful design was a response to gamification. I'm sure you're all familiar with that in some shape or form, the practice of enhancing non-game systems with game mechanics to um, get certain positive motivational outcomes. Now, when gamification became a big thing around the 2010s, its focus kind of steered away from um, intrinsic motivators and genuine play experiences and game mechanics to more extrinsically oriented motivators that, in my opinion, have more to do with Skinner boxes and behaviorism. So in response around that time, the term gameful design was coined in an attempt to move back towards more interest, uh, in, interesting designs. Um, gameful design calls for designers to emphasize intrinsically motivating qualities of games such as uh, curiosity, autonomy, relatedness, experimentation, competence, meaning things like that, rather than artificial progress mechanics such as leaderboards, experience points, badges, and so on, which are more common with gamification. Now, intrinsically motivated game design is actually quite rare if you look at the literature that's out there on older players, um, which has been steadily growing as a field since the 2010s as well. However, as a literature review that I did around that time indicated, um, most of the research was actually on two topics. It was on how can you make games that are useful for older adults? So in other words, research that looks for extrinsic ulterior motives to play games such as health or learning. And then there's research on how to make games that are usable by older adults. In other words, how do you remove the barriers uh, that might get in the way of older adults playing games for health and other outcomes? Now, don't get me wrong, guys. Speaking as a researcher, this is fascinating work. It's absolutely essential in relation to this audience and it has helped my own work tremendously. But as a designer, I would argue that it is quite a limited point of view on games and aging. It's, it's one that's geared almost entirely towards people who are not actively playing games or have a personal connection with the medium. It's about injecting games with external purpose and removing thresholds that people are not willing or that people are not able to overcome on their own. And while that has made a lot of sense when your audience has not really lived much of what I refer to as a game for life, then I would argue that this is rapidly changing as the amount of actively playing older adults is growing rapidly. Speaking of which, it's probably a good idea to elaborate a little bit on that and take a look at the numbers because I'm sure that they might surprise some of you. Like, how big is this older audience of digital games at this point in time? Well, to answer that question, I typically look at market reports that are publicly available, um, for instance, from the Entertainment Software Association of the US or the International Software Federation of Europe. And in this graph here, I'm comparing the percentage of gamers that are over 50 in the US, uh, according to ESA, and the percentage of gamers that are between 55 and 64 in Europe, according to ISFA. And aside from the many age gaps during which nothing was reported on 50 plus year olds, we learned that the US had an early lead, but that <clears throat> relatively speaking, the European Union has caught up by now. And taking a closer look, we can see that we can't really compare European countries that well, at least not 10 years ago. And a market study by Nuzo in 2017 added that globally speaking, about 15% of players are over 50, a number that dropped when they added more countries to the survey. And finally, um, Gamma Data reported that 4.4 of gamers are over 50 in China, which is relatively a smaller number, but it's still very high considering how many players uh, you have over there. So needless to say, there are a lot of people in this group. For instance, in the US, the Entertainment Software Association is talking about 214 million players in total, which would be about 50 million players in the US being over 50 or about 30% of all 50 plus year olds being uh, or playing games. Now, before I continue, I, I, I like to illustrate that a little bit for people who play games out there with two facts. Like first, these are the concurrent player numbers on Steam that I took on a random day in 2021. Um, only four games have ever broken a barrier of 1 million concurrent players. And PUBG has the all-time record at a little over 3 million concurrent players. So those are the numbers needed to break the records on the biggest PC platform in the world. And as you can all count, 3 million is less than 2% of 50 million. So all it would take for a game to become the most popular Steam game of all time in regards of concurrent players is for 2% of those 50 uh, million 50 plus year old players to play it concurrently. Of course, that's easier said than done, but it, it does give you an indication of how large this audience really is. Second, looking to uh, some data from AARP, they found that 50 plus year olds are spending roughly around $7 billion on games in 2019. 
which is an enormous number that still needs to be confirmed by, by other research and publications. But in my opinion, it also shows you the impact that this audience can have on the industry moving down the line. In comparison, um, the 2020 global esports revenue, which is published a lot, was about $1 billion. So that's how big the, that's the amount of money that's actually being spent here. And it's a big audience, but due to population aging, it's only just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, if we visualize that a little bit, this is what our age pyramid uh, looked like in 2015. And this is what it will look like in 2050. So if you look at that graph, you'll see how top heavy that becomes. Um, and that's because by 2050, about a fifth of the world will be over 60, which um, is about double what it was in 2015 um, to give you some idea of the growth. So it's clear to see that the amount of older gamers has been increasing and is likely to increase further. Um, so a few years ago, I decided to take a look at where that audience might actually end up and do a projection. So I used some data from the, the Pew Research Center and the United Nations Census. And I found using that data, again, I did that in 2015, that about um, back then 37 million US gamers were older than 50, uh, which was what I saw in other studies as well. So then I did two scenarios. The first one was reasoning that the percentages for each age group would stay the same. So for example, we know that 23% of 65 year olds are playing games and we assume that that percentage will remain pretty much the same during the future. So applying that number to the various demographic groups, I ended up with 37, 40, and 46 million players by 2045. Now, looking at that again six years later, uh, you can already see it's not a good way to calculate it. Um, as I just said, we're already seeing more than 46 million US gamers over 50 right now, and we're still quite some time away from 2045. Um, but that's what I expected when I was looking into this as well. So in my notes back then, I was like, well, this is probably an unlikely scenario as there's no reason for people who are playing in their 40s to stop playing when they're in their 50s. So we do the second projection. Um, what happens when people who have been playing just keep playing as they grow older? And that's scenario two. Young gamers of today become old gamers of tomorrow as people don't stop playing. And it looks a little bit like this. Um, we end up with about 105 million U.S. gamers over 50 by 2045. So in other words, more U.S. gamers than uh, today's populations of Spain and Italy combined or Germany and the Netherlands or Egypt, whatever you want to use as your reverence point. However, this is all just conjecture. And we have some data to compare this with as well right now. For instance, AARP has uh, done some research on this as well, and they have two data points that we can use. Um, and they reported 39 in 2016 and 51 million US gamers older than 50 in 2019. Um, so if you then put that on a graph, this is what it looks like. And that would actually put us on track to hit about 142 million US um, 50 plus year old gamers um, by 2045, which is what you can see in the graph. Uh, the bottom one is the first scenario that I had, the middle one is the second scenario and the ARP uh, projection would be the top one then. So while the future will tell how things will actually progress, right now it looks like gaming in li later life is, is really only gonna grow. Um, but more importantly, as I mentioned earlier, it's also gonna change. We, we discussed this already with this visual, the culture surrounding play in later life is changing and getting back to the original topic of this presentation then, how do you accommodate the 50 plus demographic with that kind of cultural change in mind? How can you design for gameful life? That's really the question that um, I concern myself with. And I think that the, the big answer to that question um, has been around for a while. It's a matter of providing meaningful play. Um, you want to make games that are meaningful to your audience, which I would argue is always the key to good game design. Um, and for further reading on that topic, I would recommend, um, you know, the established book Rules of Play by Katie Sale and Eric Zimmerman, who explored this idea for game design in general. However, in relation to the topic of games and aging, providing meaningful play is a matter of a game supporting players across three domains. First, um, oh, there's something wrong on the slide there, but first it's, it's access, allowing for players to play your game and getting the most of it. Second, it's a matter of providing great content. So offering experiences that are highly engaging to your player. And third, it's the story of understanding the context of the player, providing experiences that fit the player's life and their life history. So let's take a closer look at that. And I'm going to do a quick look at access first, because no matter who you are, there will come a day in your life when you are likely to face a nature related disability, one that might prevent you from, from using a gamepad, from hearing audio cues, from keeping track of the action on screen. Heck, there might be a day when you actually need help to just turn on a console or a PC. There's just no way around that. 
Um, and looking at some statistics on that, we find that about 36% of 65 plus year olds reported disability in, in the survey, according to the US Department of Health and Human Services, uh, which would account for 40 million people. And that's actually a really low number. I've seen surveys like this as well that report even up to 50% of 65 plus year olds reporting any kind of disability. Um, so, and these are also just registered disabilities as well. So you can have reduced side movement and hearing that will impact you playing games without it even counting as a disability in this kind of a survey. Now, I'm sure that there are many students in the audience tonight, and, and this is a topic that I personally find to be very underrepresented at game development programs. So um, for people falling in that category, I wanted to share some quick resources. So if you're interested in learning more about this, because I'm not going to go deeper into it much, um, first, there's the IGDA Special Interest Group on Accessibility for Games, and they have an excellent website from, called GameAccessibilityGuidelines.com, um, where you'll find all the information and the experts you need to get better at this topic. And second, this is the, the, the cheat sheet that I actually use myself. It's a summary of guidelines um, that I got through the academic community from multiple papers um, and that are specific for aging demographics. Some of these things are rather obvious, such as the ability to slow down the pace of your game or using larger fonts. Others are less obvious, like avoiding higher frequencies or adjusting the amounts of words per minute that are being said. Now, most importantly though, I don't think that the implementation of any of these um, will really drag down your project or cost fortunes or conflict with your design goals. Um, so I think that's an important thing to realize. And aside from this cheat sheet, I have three guidelines actually that go a bit deeper into that that I live by. And the first one being is that it's very difficult to, all the, to do all those items on that slide, but every little bit helps. So you don't necessarily have to implement everything, but if you, for instance, just make your game accessible to colorblind, you'll already have helped a huge amount of people. Second, you want to think about these things from the very beginning of the design process, which is a mistake. I see my own students make a lot, and I certainly made that mistake myself in the past as well. When you're trying to figure out the implementation of a game mechanic idea that you just had, that's when you want to think about the accessibility, not when the game is almost finished and you have to redesign a whole bunch of things just to accommodate things. And then finally, while age-related adjustments are necessary, they're often very personalized. A lot of the things that I mentioned uh, were about providing an option in the game setting right on that slide. So I feel it's fair to say that a lot of it is about adjusting the interface, and that's good um, because you want to adjust the interface and not the challenge. Older adults still want to be challenged in the game, and all the research that I've done, I've noticed this very much. For instance, I'll, I'll never forget um, how we were, you know, I was just interviewing a 70 plus year old uh, research participant talking about the games they like. They're like, oh, I like Trackmania. I'm like, oh, I, you know, I'd, I'd love to see you play Trackmania. Um, so we played it together and I just got destroyed at that game by him. And this is a 70 plus year old guy whose reaction speed should have been a lot slower than mine at the time. But, you know, even though this is a, a stunt driving game, that's all about reaction speed, spatial awareness, and it's definitely not designed specifically for older adults. It didn't stop this guy. He played it day after day until he got really good at it and was able to beat every practice level. So always keep that in mind when you're designing for older adults. Accessibility should never interfere with providing a proper challenge. Um, if the interface allows them to do so, older adults will persevere and master your game. And there's plenty of examples like this specific one. But anyways, enough about accessibility. Let's get back to the main question here. And because I'm going to talk a little bit about content. So what does it mean to make engaging content for aging players? Well, um, let's start by looking at the state of the art first and ask ourselves what content are older players or older adults playing today. And if you look at the big surveys, uh, you actually get a very traditional profile. It's, it's card and puzzle games. Um, this is from ESA, the Entertainment Software Association in the US. But if you look at the AARP study, uh, you'll find a similar story. So, the market research out there is mostly pushing for a traditional profile of older players that are playing puzzle games, uh, card games, um, and traditional games uh, like a Mahjong um, rather you know, than a more complicated board game. So, however, I've done a lot of um, qualitative research, and I've always saw a lot more variety than these specific genres um, that just pop up in these, these big quantitative surveys. And of course, as everybody in academia will tell you, you want to be careful with market reports. So I looked into the sampling of these studies, and these are high sampling numbers, but they're not ridiculously high. And I 
I happen to have access to a study with far higher sampling numbers through my friend Nikki, whose company Quantic Foundry does marketing for the game industry. So we looked into it as well. And these are some of the games that um, this research found to be far more uh, prevalent amongst older players than amongst younger players. So these are the top five games as they're listed per, genre, uh, per gender, uh, with some of them appearing on both lists. And if we look at these genres, we'll see that there's a lot more here than just card and puzzle games. And there's actually a lot of variety uh, within each, each genre. Like there's you know um, high fantasy and social role playing versus science fiction and so forth. So it's just that everybody tends to play casual games these days, uh, such as card and puzzle games. And while they're more prevalent with older adults, um, you'll just see those come up even with younger generations as well, that there's a lot of um, higher numbers for, for those kinds of genres. And with older adults, it just gets more exemplified. But if you look under the hood, my um, impression is that you find a lot more variety. For example, these are some of the games that I found with the participants in my own research as games that are commonly popping back up or that are popular with older players. And again, there's a lot of variety there which is really not too surprising as a common theme in the literature is that a lot of older players want innovative, meaningful experiences. So while the common denominator might be puzzle games, there's more to that picture. Um, but I should also stress in, in both the studies done in my own work, that of my colleagues or the, the big one by Quantic Foundry, which I think is using 144,000 participants, there's also another finding that is important to keep in mind. The research shows that older adults are actually less motivated to play games than younger adults. So I've always found that fascinating. And I think one of the reasons for that um, is pretty straightforward because we have, I have, pl I have plenty of stories about it on my own, but other research have found as well. And I think Celia Pierce, who also works at Nordeastern, actually voiced this perfectly in one of uh, the very first papers on games and aging even. Um, older players feel that games often don't meet their interests because they're too formulaic and derivative They've already played a lot of games and there's too much emphasis on the graphics and not enough on innovation. Now, I think that there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, and, but I think it all starts with how older players are approached when games are made specifically for them. Because <clears throat> if we're honest here, if you think about games that are specifically made for an older demographic, what comes to mind? Well, for me, it's brain training games and exert gaming. And I think that's problematic because Brain games and extra games, their core message is one of unrealistic material ideals. They ask us to mostly reject aging rather than embrace it. And they put forward that what is valued in society is tied to youthfulness and your ability to do certain things. Now, it's nothing new for the game industry to target an audience through superficial ideals like that. Um, just think about all the pink games that are marketed towards girls. It's, it's usually a matter of marketing widespread stereotypes that are often aimed at controlling a certain demographic, if you will. And as an industry, uh, we're really doing the same thing to older players, I would argue, that we have been doing to female players for years by having this focus on just health games. Um, and to put it likely, I think we should do better because as long as we as a society keep rejecting games um, for or the, frivol the frivolity of play, and we refuse to embrace play as a meaningful addition to healthy aging in its own right, the result is that it can become a taboo. Um, Dionne Westwood and Lisa Lotte van der Leeuwen, if you're familiar with those authors, have written papers on that. And, and earlier this week, actually, I, I stumbled on this breakdown by blogger Jennifer Derrick, who pointed out how certain play activities are okay for adults to engage in, while others are not, with, again, a clear emphasis on one being more serious forms of play uh, that are acceptable, while frivolous uh, play not being acceptable, which is something that I found in my own research as well. For example, this is a, a quote from, from a study I did, and this 62-year-old participant felt so pressured by her peers that she used to refer to a Bible verse, Matthew 18, 3, to defend herself, all because she liked to play Kirby's Dreamland on her old Game Boy. Um, and I, I think that's pretty grim, but it gets even worse when you realize that we are pushing these awful ideas often to market games that aren't very effective at what they claim to do. If you look at the consensus of the scientific community on brain games, we don't actually have compelling evidence that they work. And that's, you know, this specific um, statement is signed by a lot of extremely well-respected names in the field, many of which would directly profit if we actually had that evidence. So now, of course, 
brain games have been very successful selling copies, but then again, scared people will buy anything, right? And in my research, I talked to many older adults who were disillusioned by brain games um, as they never perceived any effect of it and they didn't feel that the games were very fun or engaging for them. Um, which is probably why in that list earlier, there aren't really any game, uh, any health games being mentioned amongst the favorite games for older adults. So anyway, regardless of the effectiveness of brain games, um, I think we need to allow older adults to engage in trivial play as well and design games that are truly fun to play and engaging and get rid of all those stereotypes. We, we need to design for meaningful play experiences, not gamify training exercises when we're thinking about adult playing, um, because play should be about happiness. It should be about positive psychology, about self-cultivation and having fun. Um, for instance, you know, as you can see on the slide, I, I love the idea of senior playgrounds being built over the world. But that's kind of the mindset that I like to see um, when working with students on games for older adults. Um, trying to get into that kind of a mindset because we all know how important play is when children grow up. And well, my argument would be that it's just as important when you grow old. If you really need an ulterior motive to play, then you're probably doing it wrong. So anyways, aside from looking beyond stereotypes and the content that we develop for older players, um, my research has identified a few additional guidelines as well. Uh, the first one being, you wanna use Geronto aesthetics that appeal to older adults. So what is that all about? Well. Geronto refers to old age, obviously, and aesthetics is a term that I borrowed from the authors of the MDA framework, uh, which stands for mechanics, dynamics, aesthetics. Now, if you're not familiar with that, put briefly, the aesthetics are the intended emotional experiences that we look for in game design, which is why it's pictured closer to the player than the designer. Um, the player is in control of their own, their own emotional experience, so those are the aesthetics. However, as a designer, you want to envision these experiences at the beginning of your design process. And then you want to create mechanics that will result eventually through the dynamics into those aesthetics. So for example, um, if you want the player to feel challenged, you might design some clever puzzle mechanics. Now, the authors of MDA provide a list of aesthetics in their papers, experiences um, such as the ones on the slide, like sensation, uh, you know, the player's sense of being stimulated by the game, fantasy, indulging yourself in a fantasy role, narrative, challenge, fellowship, discovery, expression, and submission. I'm not going to go into all of them, but these are all emotional experiences that you could get from certain game mechanics. Um, now, the thing is, these work really well. They're, it's not an exhaustive list, um, but they are focused on a general audience. So uh, I did some research to figure out, like, okay, are there any specific aesthetics that would work for an older audience? And through a lot of studies, actually, I ended up with six of them. The first three were identified from working with non-playing older adults and their grandchildren. Um, it's cultivation, games as personal growth. For instance, I want to play Rome Total War because I want to learn about ancient warfare. Um, the second one is contribution or playing games to give back to society. I, I help out new clan members online in, in, in New World, for instance, which is uh, an MMORPG that a lot of older adults are playing these days. Um, there's connectedness or playing games as a shared activity, um, preferably with people that you genuinely care about rather than strangers online. For instance, uh, my son and I love to play Hearthstone together. Um, and then those were the first three. I, I added uh, three more by looking at actively playing older adults, um, and we found compensation amongst them. So compensation is playing to replace unavailable activities. For instance, you play FIFA because you can no longer play real life soccer. Um, then there's contemporaneity. For instance, you're playing virtual reality games because you want to keep up with the times and um, these games feel very cutting edge. And then finally, there's conduit, which means games as a conduit to a nostalgic past. So you might, for instance, play a World War II game because um, you yourself, if you're of a certain age or your parents um, were involved in that war and um, which might not even be a very nostalgic past with that regard, but there might be some emotional connection to it. Um, and all these six aesthetics, I've seen more with older adults than, than with younger audiences. And I found that they will help your game to appeal to older adults. And unintentionally, they also all have positive outcomes for them. So for example, nostalgia is all about reminiscing, which has, or conduit is all about reminiscing, which has been demonstrating have significant health benefits. So to appeal to older adults, my advice would be to try to make games that lead to these emotional experiences. And within that, you'll probably have in, uh, intrinsic usefulness rather than having to inject it with something external.
So that's my first recommendation. My second one is to provide mature content, um, games for grownups. And by that, I, I don't mean this. <laughs> I mean something more in line of this. So let's say instead of intense violence, we have innovative gameplay. Instead of sexual themes, we have thought-provoking themes. Instead of strong language, meaningful dialogue. Instead of blood and gore, we have aesthetic experiences. Now, you know, for 14-year-olds, sure, great innovative gameplay might be the same as intense violence, but that's not the case for average adults. Um, and while we have a lot of games that do great power fantasies, the vast majority of games struggle immensely with dealing with anything that's genuinely mature still. If you think about how the theme of loss and grief is dealt with in an average um, action game, um, it's not great. So um, on average, you'll, you'll find that older adults prefer softer and smarter content over faster and aggressive content. And that is something that's been established for other media as well, for instance, TV. Um, and I think the industry is actually doing a good job there, even though we can still improve. In particular, indie games are certainly getting there. Um, you know, I've, I've tried playing Papers, Please with older adults. It went really well. And, and why wouldn't it, right? It's, it's a great puzzle game. It's embedded in a social realist novel. Um, it has innovative gameplay, meaningful dialogue, thought-provoking, beautiful pixel art, and so on. Um, and I think this is a key point for me, really. I think curating and marketing indie game stores to older adults is, is very important. And um, while I'm discussing this, I think curation should start with building on something that is already familiar for this audience. Um, another way to combat um, derivation is to deconstruct and subvert, for instance, if you take a classic solitaire card game, which most people have played over and over, you could go to a game like Sage Solitaire, which is a minimalist new spin on the genre that will have you hooked in an instant as it cleverly improves that formula and makes it feel new and fresh. Or if you want to take it further, you can add some emergent narrative and theme to it and, and play a game like Car Thief, which at its core is still a solitaire experience, um, but it feels a lot fresher and it has a lot more to offer um, than the standard game. And you can even take this to non-game activities as well. Like if you take live theater, which is obviously very popular with older populations as well. Well, what if you uh, take your game to use live actors? Well, The Under um, is an indie game with, by Samantha Gorman and her team, who's also a professor at Northeastern, that involves live actors who improvise and provide a digital VR interactive theater experience. If you haven't checked this out, you absolutely should. It's, it's amazing. So anyways. Um, my next guideline is uh, something that I always found very fascinating when I was working with older players. It's imagination matters. While um, with younger generations, and I'm, I'm sure if you play a lot of games, you're familiar with this, we often cry out for, for killer graphics and, and you know, the most um, the high fidelity audio visuals, right? But when you're looking at older adults, multiple stu studies have actually find, found that they don't care as much about graphics. They care more about fantasy and visualization. Now, I'm not sure if this will stand the test of time, um, but I think it kind of makes sense. Because if you look at this game, so this game was called Spitfire. Um, it's, it was a game for the Atari 2600, so this is super old school, obviously. Um, and for 1983, that was an impressive game. Um, but here's why I'm showing you this. This is a quote from one of the participants in my research. And if you look at the first paragraph, it's meaningful to him. The second paragraph, it's an aesthetic experience. And the third one, it's all of that because of the imagination, like these little sounds, these little graphics transport him to a different world. And if that's how you grew up with games, it's less important for the high fidelity. Um, here's another quote that goes in a similar path um, from somebody in the study who was a major Age of Empires 2 fan. And again, it emphasizes a lot of games being too detailed and getting in the way of the imagination of the player. So I think that's a very interesting take um, uh, that I've seen in a lot of research with older adults as well. And I'm very curious to see how well this will age um, as generations that didn't grow up with a game like Spitfire or... Um, you know, maybe something like Age of Empires um, will grow older. Then again, there's always D&D &D that does this type of thing really well, I think. So anyways, you do not necessarily have to get very expensive and realistic graphics when you're making games for older adults. And I think that's really cool. Um, another one is designing for crystallized intelligence. So what does that mean? Well, there's two kinds of intelligence that matter for this topic, really. There's, there's fluid intelligence. So all kinds of intelligence that are depend independent of your past. So things like reaction speed, pattern recognition, um, abstract reasoning and problem solving. And um, the research shows you that these typically peak uh, in young adulthood um, and then they decline, kind of like what you see on the graph now. 
Um, but then there's crystallized intelligence. And that's the kind of intelligence that um, does rely on your past. So things like your vocabulary or your reading comprehension or the application of skills and knowledge to solve problems. And the cool thing is that if you look at this research, those skills actually peak way later in life. So while it's important as a game designer to provide accessibility accommodations for declining fluid skills, you could also look at it in a different light and try to specifically design for crystallized intelligence. And there are games that are doing that really well. Um, for instance, Synonymy is a, a brilliant word game that challenges your vocabulary um, by having you find the shortest distance between two words based on their synonyms. So you start with one word and you come up with a synonym for that word and you try to come up with synonyms that are slightly different until you end up with your end word. It's, it's, if you've never played, you should try it out. It's super cool. Um, but it, 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 you know, your fluid intelligence is not going to help you much with it. Um, similarly, The Secret World is an MRPG that I really loved that offers investigation missions that are all based on prior knowledge to complete and that have nothing to do with it's otherwise hack and slash gameplay. Like for some of them, you need to understand hexadecimal code and stuff like that. So these are games that require the use of crystallized intelligence. Um, but unfortunately, they typically don't really advertise themselves as games for that an older audience would love or even that this is part of it. Um, of course, that doesn't mean that you can't use um, any fluid intelligence either. You know, if, if, if you look back at um, Trackmania guy that I was talking about earlier, um, but you can definitely train for that. And I think if we can get games that are specifically combining both, that's kind of where the sweet spot is. Um, because, yeah, most games are far more about fluid intelligence and far less about crystallized intelligence. At least crystallized intelligence has nothing to do with knowing how a gamepad works or having played games prior to the game that you're now playing. So anyways, let's move on to, to multiplayer, because when it comes to social play, there's a couple of guidelines as well, of course. Um, and I think the really big one here is to help older adults find the right player to play with, uh, which is also true for younger audiences, but even more so for older audiences. I'll illustrate it with a couple of quotes. Um, so older adults want adults to play with most of the time. Uh, I found in a lot of interviews that we've done that pubescent gaming behavior is not something that older adults like unless it comes from people that are the same age as they are um, and in fact one of my participants who was also in a guild specifically sought out obnoxious teenagers to to beat them because they got good at the game and they they wanted to do something about people trolling other people online so maturity matters for older adults who, who play online um, but there's other factors as well. Things like language, localization is a very important factor in finding the right player. Um, because with older generations, a lot of the time language can be a barrier more than for younger generations that have grown up with an English speaking internet. Um, and of course, their skill. It's a lot more fun if you're both at a similar skill level. Now, for female players, there's another story there as well, unfortunately. Because harassing women is uh, something of all ages, if you look at the research. So maturity is not always the same as your age. And this is probably um, a reason for a big finding in the literature that the vast majority of older players still prefer to play single player. And if you, you, know, if you keep in mind that um, amongst older players, there is um, a larger representation of female players, it all fits together really easily. And I think that this is an important part to consider as the research shows that as we age, we are, we are less likely to invest energy into new people as well. So we're just not going to um, spend the energy in, into getting into an environment that is somewhat hostile. Um, and perhaps that's, that might also be an explanation for why Skyl Children of Light um, had a surprisingly high amount of 50 plus year old players. Genova Chen, the, one of the designers of the game, mentioned that at Games for Change. And it makes sense because uh, Sky Children of the Light is a social experience where you can't really communicate with words with one another. So you don't really know who the other person is and you can't form any prejudices against them. Of course, another solution is to let players play with who they know and love, in particular, their younger family members, which is another guideline designed for intergenerational play. And I actually did this, I had the opportunity to do this on one of my projects. I, I worked on Nintendo Wii game myself that was all about intergenerational play. And it was amazing. Just seeing two generations collaborate and compete is an amazing feeling as a designer. And it's actually pretty hard to pull off with when it works, it's extremely powerful. And I feel that too few companies are making games that focus on this. So you want older players to be able to play with younger family members. Um, and I feel a good way to do this is what I call vicarious play. 
So vicarious play is where one player does the controls and the other player helps to think and solve puzzles. Um, and adventure games from the 90s are actually very suitable for that. We did some research on that too. Um, and I found a lot of people in my studies uh, when I interviewed them about the games they like to play with uh, younger children would diverge to these kinds of games because they're just so well made for it. They let the younger person do the controls while they are helping to figure out the puzzles, which might be a little bit too tough sometimes for um, somebody younger. And when the younger person is a, is a small child, there's, there's a lot of opportunities there. However, while this is a popular way to play, I don't know that many games that are specifically designing for this. Like maybe a game like Mario Galaxy, where you have the star collecting second remote that you could use um, so that one player can just help pick up stars is kind of that feature, I guess. But um, I'd love to see more games that are specifically tuning into this. So if you're designing games, I, I, you know, <laughs> this is something that I would recommend, um, yeah, as an interesting path to go down. Um, so anyways, let's move on to the last content guideline that I have, um, which is about representation, because I feel that older adults are not represented well in games, and it's, it's, it's a problem. Um, take these images, for instance. I, you know, I googled, because we bowling is so big in retirement communities in the US, so you'll find hundreds of pictures if you search for older adults playing. Um, but, you know, what's wrong with this picture? Well, I mean, these are all white people. Um, and if you look at the research, actually, communities of colors actually have relatively larger representation of 50 plus year old players. So this, this image that is so often found in the media is deeply biased. However, in the games themselves, um, it's not a lot better either. Because if we park the racial issue, um, it's still mostly a matter of three stereotypes um, through which older adults are being represented. It's the cute chibi menial task granny that needs your help or that will teach you a skill. There's the super powered action hero granny, uh, shotgun optional. And then there's the terrifying give your old grandmother a kiss a horror granny. And while these are not necessarily a problem in certain types of games and contexts and for certain purposes, this is a very limited portrayal of aging in games though, as even male characters, while sometimes looking a little gruffier, are still falling in these stereotypes um, because similar to the marketing, just being a well-rounded older person in a game is, is not commonly an option in mainstream games. And, and that's unfortunate because the research shows that when given the opportunity, older players prefer their avatars to reflect aspects of their former lost selves uh, or to embrace their current age state. And while there are some great indie examples of that, Mainstream games are really not doing that yet. Um, although I have to say I was pleasantly surprised at the latest iteration of Tony Hawk Pro Skater, uh, which actually has 50, uh, 350 plus year olds uh, that are being themselves and they're not looking like their physical primes, which is something they could have easily done. But, you know, after all, I mean, skating is a lifestyle and it's centered about self-expression. That obviously doesn't end once somebody becomes 50. And, you know, when real life 52 year old Tony Hawk can still do a vert front side 180 heel flip, then I think it wouldn't be fair to classify this as the action granny trope either. So anyways, um, I think I've made my point that we need some more content um, for older players. Um, so let's move to the final category, <coughs> excuse me, which is context. Um, because when designing for older players, we are designing for people who have lived quite a bit of life already and it's key in understanding how they play. And I'll illustrate that using my own player classification. So it's based on four concepts. There is content-oriented motivation or playing for reasons that are related to the game themselves, the gameplay, the fantasy world. There's contextual motivation, which is playing for reasons that are related to other activities. For instance, I'm playing because I want to procrastinate or I want to make something else more fun. I'm in a waiting room, for instance. Um, there's playing for, um, for pleasure, which can be a simple emotional response to playing, um, such as a sense of competence or connectedness. And then there's um, playing in function of usefulness, which we've discussed earlier as well, but I still think it's, it's, it's relevant, even though I'm not a big fan of designing just for that. Um, so knowledge or skills acquisition falls under usefulness. And while that explanation for playing is oversimplified, it does create a nice two-dimensional space in which I have five archetypes of older players that I found in my own research. So I'm going to start uh, in the bottom right with the time wasters. So time wasters are people that are playing specifically because there's nothing better to do, and it's a contextual motivation. Um, when I talk to people uh, in this category, they typically mention how they want to spend their time as useful as possible, and they look for quick puzzle games and adaptations of traditional games in particular, like a Sudoku, um, to just get through some unstructured time. 
Next on the other side, we have the freedom fighters. Freedom fighters are playing in function of freedom of choice, autonomy, and relaxation, and living your life at your own pace. Um, so the primary motive here is contextual. They, they're trying to get away from activities that they don't want to do, and they just want to have fun. That's all that matters. And it shows in the games that they're playing. I mean, it's all about instant gratification, Candy Crush, Bejeweled, Plants vs. Zombies, those kinds of games. Now, in the middle between content-oriented and contextual-oriented play, we find the compensators, which is similar to the time wasters people who are playing because there's nothing better to do. But for them, it's every day. It's chronically um, because there is some age-related decline making their life so. Um, and their primary motive is still contextually oriented because there's a lack of other activities and games help them to get through the day. But when you interview these uh, kind of participants, they voice that it's important that games are fun uh, and not just to get them through the day because it's, it's that important to them. So pleasure, usefulness, we're kind of in the middle there. So what kind of games do they play? Well, I found that they play a lot of games that provide fantasies and social interactions as oftentimes they're stuck at home and they don't get to talk to too many people um, outside the people that visit them. And as a result, you see a lot of games with online casual uh, or online casual games with chat rooms, but also like Second Life or, or big um, uh, massive role-playing games online. So then um, if we move upwards, we got the value seekers. So these are people that are playing in function of learning and cultural relevance, their lifestyle and their broader interests. So this is really about the game. So it's about a game that really fits their lifestyle, their interests, and they're playing for content. However, the content is very meaningful and it's perceived as useful because it's all about self-cultivation, which puts them to the right of the spectrum. And the games that they play reflect that. It's, it's war games for people that are really obsessed with, with the military or sports games or flight simulators or civilization games for history buffs, uh, point and click adventures uh, for the same category. Even health and brain games fall into this group often. Um, so yeah, that's the value seekers. And then finally, we have the ludophiles, which is a group for who playing games is a general passion. So their primary motive is, again, about the games themselves. It's about the content. And they'll play anything. Even booking a last, last minute flight could be a game to them. Um, and pleasure is, is very much king here. It's all about getting good at these games, um, no matter what game it is. And the kind of games that they play is extremely varied, because they'll play anything that looks fun. And they'll play niche titles like many indie games as well. So anyways, um, these player types really help to explain um, how people play games. And more importantly, though, um, I found through this work that, um, well, it gives me an explanation for how they play, but also it shows you how age-related decline actually has limited explanatory power. Um, and it also shows you that this is a very heterogeneous audience that attributes a lot of different meanings to games. However, Perhaps most importantly, it also shows you how contextually motivated players are less stable in their gaming preference. And I'm going to illustrate that um, with one more guideline that I have, which is designing for a life filled with change. Because you really want to take people's lifespan into account. Um, older adults have different past experiences and they influence how they look at your game. And I'm going to illustrate that with a quick detour into the work of a colleague of mine uh, who's a gerontologist. Uh, Julie Brown, because she developed a life course theory of digital gaming that I find absolutely amazing. Um, and it goes a little something like this. So first, she noted that older adults have different motivations for playing games, which is something that I've been talking about for quite some time now. Um, however, motivation is just one part of the story. The second dimension is ability, um, which we also address to some extent. It's uh, you know, accessibility, but also having enough time, having enough money, um, just having the means in general to play games. And that's kind of where you start diverging from general audiences as younger players typically do have different problems um, accessing games. Let's just put it that way. So that gives us an X and a Y axis, but it's actually a three-dimensional model. It has a Z axis. And the last one is experience. So um, Julie interprets this as um, the experience that people have playing games, but in my opinion, I, I just look at their entire life experience. And that's where there's obviously a huge disconnect with younger generations because older adults have a lot more experience in life. So as a designer, I try to keep tabs on all three of these domains as opposed to focusing just on motivation or just on experience or just on accessibility. Um, and I'll put this to practice with a brief example. So say you're 50, right? And you've never played much, but you find out about um, a game like Farmville on the App Store on, you know, on your mobile device. Um, you don't have a lot of experience playing games necessarily um, or motivation to play yet, but you've just started to play games and now you find yourself in the left box um, at the very uh, upper top. Um, but you like this game and the room for creativity that it offers and your motivation for creative games like it goes up. So you end up looking for more games on other platforms like your PC. And by the time you're 55, five years later, 
you get into a game like Second Life, a creative online experience that takes you to a completely different area of that box. And now you have a bit of experience playing games, your, your ability is getting better, your motivation is higher, and you've made a lot of friends in the online world as well. However, by the time you're 65, your partner gets a severe medical condition, one that requires you to be their caretaker and your time to play, your ability to play, therefore gets limited severely. And the people that you were hanging out with in Second Life, they're no longer online when you can play. So you still love to play these games though, but you have to limit yourself. And now you're playing Microsoft Solitaire whenever you find a free moment. And so people are transitioning around this box and, and older adults do this a lot more. And this theory really illustrates how context changes over time and how designing for an older or an adult population, because this applies to more than just 50 plus year olds, obviously, um, how does, yeah, how that's an important part of it. And with that, I feel we get a good summary of how I see game design for the new 50 plus year old player. It's, it's a long list, <laughs> but I think it works really well and it's worked really well for me in particular. Because um, quite frankly, I now use this whenever I design games, not just when I'm designing for older players. Um, originally, it was just about older players, but not anymore. So to wrap this up, I wanted to talk briefly about my last project and how that relates back to all this research that I've been doing um, and all the insights that are on this slide. So that project was called Brugel. It was released in uh, November of 2019, it has been translated to nine languages. It was made in Unreal Engine. Uh, I got some help with, from students, but it was mostly a solo project. Budget-wise, very low budget. Um, it's a commercial published game and it took me four years to develop. Now, while the following might sound a little pompous, um, I feel I should mention that this game did pretty well because it's relevant for the, for the presentation. So this game got a good amount of international press. It didn't get picked up by the big review sites, but uh, a lot of small niche ones did and they were extremely positive and the game um, received a whole bunch of awards in, including industry awards. And it has been displayed at the Smithsonian and the Akron Art Museum. Um, so anyways, like it, it's just important to realize that this game did well because I think the reason why it did well goes back to what I was just talking about. Anyways, I'm gonna quickly show you the trailer and then we'll get to that part. I don't know the mess of all. Hoe noemde de mensen dat al toen ze al tegen? Ook de Bruegel. Ja, dat horen we wel. En? Ze kwamen binnen, hè? All right, so that's basically me and my grandmother who was 92 at the time and I, I interviewed her for five hours and the game is um, it's built around her memories of her childhood and teenage years. So it's a game that abandons the heroic soldier perspective and replaces that with that of the innocent bystander. So the goal here is to share her very personal history as well as building up empathy for refugees as you see what life is like inside of a war zone. So some, I've got some spoiler-free notes here about the design. So first off, the first part of the game is pretty much about you walking around in the house that my grandma grew up in. You have your smartphone and you can take pictures of the objects that you find. And there's actually a list that will fill up. And to make taking pictures as fun as possible, there are some photography settings as well. So eventually you take a picture, you hear my grandmother talk about the object. Now, um, these stories will teach the player about who the main characters are of the game and why you should care about them. That's the main goal there. Um, and they will also learn about how much stuff her life was back then, in particular for my grandmother B and her sister Bertha, because they had to raise six siblings after their mother died. So that's the first part of the game, making the player care about the family, learn a little bit of history along the way. Now, after midnight, the ghosts of the past reveal themselves and the player will live through some of my grandmother's uh, war stories. Now, at first, this transition um, is, is pretty subtle, and players typically do not notice it until it's too late, but later on, the game has its uh, Jacob's Ladder, Stranger Things, Silent Hill-style moments like what you see on the video right now. 
So as Bruegel's Nightmare version comes alive, the gameplay also takes a turn. While in the first part, players have a lot of control. You decide what you photograph. You decide which stories you want to hear. The second part is just about surviving and doing what the inhabitants of the house tell you to do. You'll hear these unsettling stories whether you want it or not. And this loss of control mimics how my grandmother and her sister were in charge of the household prior to the war, but were forced to do whatever soldiers told them to do when the war started. And of course, there's actually a story and a moral going on here, but I, I don't really want to spoil that for, for anyone. Just give it a go if that's something you might be interested in, and feel free to shoot me an email if you want a free Steam key for it. Uh, anyways, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the challenges of putting this game together um, to wrap things up. So first, this was a substantial design challenge. Everything in this game is based off of my grandmother's subjective recollection. So for example, the farmhouse doesn't really exist anymore makes it really hard to figure out that weird architecture of a house that was built in the 1400s, because I've never lived in one like that. Um, but this is how we made a room. We started with some, some sitting down with B, making some sketches, going into Illustrator, starting to draw everything up, and then eventually we verify everything. Um, then I went online with her, looked for reference pictures, start to make some concept art, had a student help me with some concept art as well. Again, we verified it with her. Um, and then we had some 3D models that were built uniquely for the game and others we just bought online. Um, and then we put it everything together. And this is a lot more complicated than just making something fictional, in my opinion, because there's a lot of steps that you have to take to make sure that you're getting the recollection and that it makes sense. Because I want it to be her subjective perception, uh, the game. To me, it mattered less that it was historically ac accurate rather than that it was her accurate representation of, of, of her perception of it. Um, so everything is based on, on the memories in this game. Um, there's no acting involved. Lord knows that my grandmother would be incapable to act. I mean, we've tried it. At some point, you just want some filler, um, you know, some filler lines, but she literally couldn't. And when making this game, well, usually you write your story. Uh, then you have the voice actor through the dialogue, but here the dialogue was done before I even know what my mechanics were going to be. So turning it into a coherent narrative was not as easy as it sounded. Um, the trick was really recording the same story over and over and visiting her multiple times, which was tons of fun. Um, like, really, I'm not being sarcastic here. Um, and I used qualitative analysis methods um, with NVivo to then basically start analyzing it like you would for qualitative research. And there's a Gamma Sutra post on my methodology for doing this, which you can see on the slide if, if you're interested in that kind of process. Um, so anyways, how does that relate back to what I learned from working with older players? Well, here's an overview of those three principles that I discussed. And I implemented, um, when we look at access, I implement as many of the accessibility features as I could uh, within my budget, because every little bit helps. And I could have done a heck of a lot more if I had more time, but I went as far as I could. And I had a lot of people comment me on like, that it was great that you did this because I wanted to play this game and now I could. Uh, in terms of content, we already discussed how I addressed representation by giving my muse a lot of creative control, but we also decided to use her actual voice instead of a voice actor, which was a deliberate choice here. Um, the puzzles in the game were, some of them that I implemented were specifically about language. Uh, I minimized fluid intelligence as much as possible. There are very few ways to die in the game. Um, and there are puzzles that really re require reading comprehension and prior knowledge, um, which were never fully required to make progress though. So if people who aren't into that stuff don't want any of it, they could still make progress. But for people who are, um, they can make progress in a more advantageous way. <laughs> uh, so anyways, the first part of the game uses a collection mechanic, um, as that is one of the mechanics that is typically popular with older uh, generations. And as for the Geronto aesthetics, we've got cultivation, conduit, and connectedness from the very beginning of the project that we designed around. And finally, to ac accommodate people with a lot of activities in their life, it's a short game. Um, partially also because of you know the amount of resources that I had to make it, but it was deliberately designed to be a short experience that would be more on par with watching a movie rather than playing a full video game. Um, and I think it fits two of the categories of the player classification as well. So is this the perfect game for an older audience? Well, of course not, <laughs> but it is inclusive of older players, regardless of the generation, um, at least. And as far as the research tells me, I think we did a good job there. Um, and I like to take credit, uh, well, I like the, uh, to have these things take credit for why the game got those accolades um, that it did. Um, and I feel that it allowed me to um, not just design a good game, but to design a game that fits a game full life. <laughs>